I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I do want to start by letting everyone know in the very unlikely case of an emergency, there are exits here in the front, straight out the glass doors, or exit uh, either of the doors to your left and uh, follow the exit signs to the outside. That being said, can I get a motion to accept the meeting agenda as presented? Mrs. Fishman with a second by Mrs. Nickerson. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right, it's unanimous. And with that, uh, no blue, blue cards. Left. All right. Being no uh, blue cards, we will not have to read through the community uh, open forum part. Um, again, next uh, week we will have a community um, session, which Mr. Cole Bufo, I'm sure, will speak to in his uh, superintendent's report. And then a little bit later in our meeting during the board reports, we'll, we will be discussing and providing. Uh, any updated discussions on safety and security around the district as a whole. Um, but with that, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Colabufo for our presentations to the board tonight. All right. So first, we can start out with a wonderful presentation from Mr. Wink and a spotlight on Hastings Mallory Elementary. started last spring. We wanted to be transparent. Starting early on and working with Mr. Calabufo and Mrs. Phillips and the CSTA, we worked to make the transition for staff to be as seamless as possible. HME appreciated the hard work of Paul Brissett and his crew and making sure we were ready for opening day. On the instructional side, I was thankful of the work done by our instructional team that is comprised of a group of teachers that came in over the summer along with Ms. Gershman and was able to create an instructional plan that was both relevant to the needs of our students and was aligned with uh, C-Square 2018. For our families, I'd like to, uh, we, we created an opportunity for our new students from uh, Miller Hawk and Central Square Intermediate to visit. We had our incoming families at multiple school events. Uh, including a carnival uh, we did on the last week of school, and we did have a pancake breakfast at Easter last year. We used to run it with us, and we did have some of our new families join us then. I'd also like to thank the staff. They came in over the summer on their own time, so we could do a supply drop-off where our new families and existing families should come in, meet their new teachers, get a lay of the land, uh, and get to say hello before the first day of school. I would like to thank the PTO for their efforts putting on uh, these events. Uh, so much of what happened at HMA is due to the support of our PTO. And their support to this whole process was truly awesome. And then the school year started. 
team building. When you have so many new people, um, you have a need to bring them together. Uh, at this time, can everybody please stick my staff, staff, uh, staff stand who's new to Hastings Valley? <laughs> <laughs> new to Hastings. And then have the staff stand for teaching new positions than they did last year. Okay. And, and so we, and this is a, just a picture of what we had to bring people together from different schools and from different grade levels. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So we wanted to create a schedule that created a focus on common planning time, a meeting schedule that allowed teachers and reading teachers and AIS teachers to meet and look at data in order to meet the needs of all their students. It is never, and we also created learning walks, I'm sorry, uh, this is very important, learning walks with teachers of multiple grade levels where we walked around and collect data on how our instruction program is going at Hastings and then we're able to take that information, discuss it, and use that for the uh, future uh, professional development planning. I'm so proud of the efforts of every staff member and the professionalism through this endeavor. For students, we've been able to expand their, in, uh, their complete educational experience. In particular, I'd like to show focus on our running club that uh, we have this year every Tuesday. Our running club is ran by uh, Tammy Hellequay, Kelly Foster, Kelly Corliss, and Katie Giesemann, among other staff who have been able to participate. Uh, during the out warmer weather, they're outside, and lately if you run, can't go in the halls on Tuesdays because you're going to get ran over by a bunch of uh, students and teachers. Um, and it, it's been absolutely wonderful. We've expanded our student leadership opportunities for our participating fifth grade students. I'd like to thank Autumn Sutton, Kristen Bell, and Jody Lewis for their efforts working with those students. Between our new instructional and social initiatives, Hastings is ensuring all students have a well-rounded educational experience. Which leads to a year that everyone should be proud of. In my opinion, the school has a warmth and feel that only a truly exceptional staff can bring together. I do not feel like this is really year one. I feel like we've been together a long time. As stated earlier, we had many wonderful social and inner instructional experiences for our students this year. At this time, I would like to focus on one of those instructional initiatives, one that exhibits collaboration and hands-on learning for our students. And I'm now going to turn it over to Mrs. Bell, our school media specialist extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank Mr. Wayne, the administration, board members, all the staff and families that um, have worked with me when I come knocking on the door saying, what can we do together? Um, today, I'd like to focus a little bit on what's new in the library, and then I have some of our teachers and some of our students that have come to showcase the work that we've done collaboratively. So what's new in the library? The Chromebooks. Every time the kids come to the library, we have them bring their Chromebooks so that we can get them used to using them. Uh, the upper grades now are working on typing in addition to the library resources, and I'm really trying to expose them to the resources that we have that either we've paid for, the state or the county has paid for, and it's wonderful to watch them when they say, oh, I didn't know you had that. Or, Look what I just found. So it's a very cool thing. Um, new book collections. I am rearranging the library to make things more accessible to our students independently. So if they're looking for a certain series, they can go to that. I'm also adding um, series that are high interest, low level, so that we can start reaching those children that have difficulties with reading, but they can be the same spot as their peers. So if you have a fifth grader that's reading on a very low level, what I've noticed in the past is they're embarrassed to go to the, the easy reader section. So these new series, one of which is the branches to Scholastic, look just as cool as the other ones. So they're all over there and they feel more comfortable and I've seen their reading grow from there. I'm also starting a section of books that are recommended titles that go along with the domain the students are reading and this will be um, There'll be separate shelves, and teachers will be contributing to that, other resources that they might use to support what's in the classroom, and that will be kind of a reserved section for them so that 
So for instance, third and fifth graders in astronomy, we have that section they can go over and use the books and supplement their classroom materials. Um, collaborative research projects, which I'll get to in a moment, but I've been very fortunate to work with almost all grade levels um, in some capacity, either through having them come to the library as a grade level, as a class, or as just a few students from each classroom to do these extension activities based on what they're learning. Um, Battle of the Books, it's a reading program that we librarians promote. Um, this year in Hastings, I've been told we have the largest group. We had 10 fifth grade teams. We had 14 third and fourth grade teams. They all did a phenomenal job. Um, any of my students that were Battle of the Books, could you just stand up? We don't have all of them here, but we have a few to represent. For the ALA readers, they were Andrew Watrous, Abby Ketchold, and Lila Kurtz, who's not able to make it this evening. Our third and fourth grade winners were the Rainbow Readers. So it was Abby Fazino, Alicia Rosario, and Caitlin. Caitlin, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can never see these things. Caitlin Richards. So the nice thing about our teams this year, guys, you can sit down, is that they were a mix of both Hastings students and former CSI students, so it was a nice way to bring the two together. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the typing practice, we've been working with the typingclub.com, so the kids, one of their choices when they come in, especially on book days, is to start working on using all kinds of fingers, which is very difficult for many of them, and to reposition them so they're not with a, a, a game console. So that's just some of the things we're working on. Um, and also, on a side note, the um, National Association of Libraries have come out with new standards. So we've been very fortunate through our department to, and through our um, SLS office through the county to be able to do a book study so that we can learn what the new standards are. There's also a movement called Future Ready Libraries, which ties in very closely to the new standards. And I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to learn these and to be able to put them into practice. And a large portion of that is collaboration and co-teaching. So we're very fortunate to have a building where everyone is willing to do that with us. So without further ado, with my kindergarten friends, Mrs. Heather Foster, Dominic, and Evan, come on up. So we sat down probably six weeks in advance. 
had practiced in the, in the classroom, having the children log on by themselves. And then Mrs. Bell and I worked to kind of ma manipulate our schedules. So I gave up my planning and went to library with the kids and brought an assistant. And I think we might have even had a parent helper. I think so. so we had lots of extra adult hands and we had the kids, a good majority of them by them already could log in. But then we taught them how to negotiate the search site that is available to all students um, through our library. And we had created note sheets that were differentiated for the kids. So some kids only had to look for one word in each category, the body, the food. Some kids had to look for complete sentence and some kids had to you know, go in and find what is the most important information in these different sections. So they took their notes independently, and we did that over two sessions. Um, uh, Mrs. Bell gave up her planning and came to my classroom one morning and spent her time there. So we had two good, solid sections of research, and then additional in um, guided reading uh, in the classroom over a few days. Once we completed that, the kids then um, created, um, together as a whole group, we created a can have our graphic organizer. So then the kids had their own graphic organizer that they had to fill in, and they had a polar bear diagram that they had the labels. And then from there, um, we had our virtual field trip. So before we went to the virtual field trip, we were able, after doing all of this research, having all of this exposure to nonfiction and fiction texts, the kids were able to generate a list of questions. How many questions do you think we had, you guys, together? What do you think? Did we, did we do like 10 questions for the whole class that we were going to ask that scientist? Yeah. Yeah, we think it was about 10 questions. So we went through and we made up 10 questions that we hadn't found the answers to yet. So then we watched the video. Was that pretty good? Yeah, what did you see? Can you tell, tell them what did you see on the video? I saw a polar bear. Yeah, do you remember, do you remember what his name was? Do you remember that? No, do you remember it now? It's Lou. So we went and we did that with the assistant of um, Kristen Edwards. She came and helped us and, and we talked to that scientist and we were able to talk right back to her, weren't we? Yeah, yeah that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So we learned all kinds of things and when we finished, then we needed to process what we learned. So when we did that, we each made, we painted a picture of the polar bear. Dominic, would you like to hold up your picture? Show these guys over here and then show the audience over there. Didn't they do a good job on their little bear baby? So then, pretty much any time you paint in Mrs. Foster's classroom, you always have to write, don't you? It's, there's no free ticket to painting. You always have to write. So, Dominic, can you read to our friends what you learned about the polar bear? I learned that polar bears are big, they have good smell. showcase kindergarten to show that these projects don't only have to be with the upper grades, which um, often people believe that 
the older kids can get more in depth, but this is a perfect example of how we can reach the primary kids on these type of projects, and Mrs. Foster and I are already in talks for our next one. Moving on, first grade, we are in the works for a project. We just haven't fully worked through the plan yet, so I will move to third grade. My third grade friend, friend, come on up and down. So over the summer, third grade approached me about doing some type of extension program with maybe pulling some kids from each class. So the first project, which I have the pictures up there, I pulled six kids, nine kids, and we did an author study. They were reading The Wind in the Willows in class, so we learned some more about Kenneth Graham, we learned about Roald Dahl, because they were reading B BFG, right? We were reading the BFG in class, so we wanted to learn some more. The kids read other books by those authors and were able to present it to the rest of the third grade. Our second group, we had nine kids, nine kids as well, and their unit was the human body. So they had decided that they wanted to do something different than a PowerPoint presentation. And this is my friend Amelia, and she's going to tell you quickly what we did. We made a breakout box, and we also did a lunch activity, and we did a game bubble. So, So that was our long activity, that was one of our stations. The kids came up with questions for a bingo game. And then, I'm not sure if people are familiar, but the new biggest thing is the breakout boxes. And so the third graders came up with uh, the questions and the ideas of how the kids were going, the rest of the class were going to open up the locks to get into the first box, and then they had another set of questions to get into the smaller box. So you have a key lock, you have a directional lock, you have a four-digit lock, you have a three-digit lock, and you have a word lock. And they were awesome. They, Amelia had brought in an extra book, so it supplemented what they were doing in the domains. Another one of my friends had um, been shopping with grandma and found a book about zombies, which at first I was like, what does zombies have to do? But it was the coolest book because it had facts about what they were learning in class and then just put the zombie twist to it, but you know, it worked. So thank you, Amelia. <laughs> and then my third group was, um, I had six kids that came down we had just gotten the Chromebooks, so we wanted to do something with Google. So they came up with Google Slides, and they were studying ancient Rome. So we thought, well, let's learn about some of the ancient Rome ruins and maybe do a flat Stanley. So they created their flat Stanley, they did research on the ruins, and then we superimposed flat Stanley in one of the pictures from the uh, ruin. So, and right now we're working on another trivia on astronomy. More to come on that one. And fourth grade. And if my fourth grade friends come on down. So, in the fall, the fourth grade teachers came to me about an idea of doing something on a grade level. And we wanted to incorporate into the Olympics because that was what was happening then and in their math and science they were wanted the kids to start thinking about how we can use this on other things. So learning, you know, what degree you have to make a slope to make the skiers go this fast or something along those lines. So for about a week and a half, all of fourth grade came to the library in the morning with their Chromebook and we had given them the choice of what sport they wanted to learn about. And we had, fourth grade team had um, created a Google Classroom and we had listed the resources they could go to and they did all the research and then in class, they created these wonderful projects. I know some of you came to see the one we had them for display and it was just an amazing thing. So thank you for all the, everyone that participated. Guys, did you want to say anything? 
taught the class because we had to use our Chromebooks and we had to search it all up and we had to figure out which slides were actually for hockey and which slides for other sports. We struggled transporting it. <laughs> And it was fun because they moved things on the shelf, so some of them popped their Chromebooks on the shelf so they could stand and do the research or found a little corner, and it was really a very cool thing. And last but not least, fifth grade. Sorry. Um, Mrs. Schaefer approached me uh, about doing a project. She does a genius hour project with her class and the kids have to come up with a question and they have to do research and then create some type of a presentation. Fifth graders, you want to come on up? So, of course I said yes and she sends them down. They already have their questions so my role is to help them find the research material and then once they're done with that, help them they're going to use some of these uh, technology tools on uh, uh, fine tuning. One of the things we're really working on is with presentations to get them so they're not putting a whole paragraph of things on there, just their bullet points and uh, citing their sources so that we know where they're coming from, including their pictures. So I have a couple of my friends here today. Um, Ms. Abby Petrol did a wonderful one on lemons, and she'll share something exciting about that. Um, a couple of slides I did on my lemon project was how you can use lemons for um, to cure like a poison ivy rash, or um, you can just use it as a nice summer drink for lemonade. <laughs> and Edward, and he did it with um, a young man named Tyler, did a wonderful one on hybrid cars, cars which I learned a lot about. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a, a group of girls that wanted to know about Maine wool. So I never heard of that, so that was new for me as well. So it's been a wonderful experience. Second grade, um, some of the teachers did a mythology project. So during library, we had them um, researching whatever god or goddess that they were working on. And they're going to be starting an insect project. So during library, we've been introducing them to different sources. So. So fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I want to quickly, uh, I know we're over our time, but I'm, I'd be remiss to say that a lot of what Ms. Bell is doing is during library, but it's also in the morning from 9.15 to 9.45, which is a little bit of an open time we have. Um, during that, our other special area people are doing wonderful things. This year, for the first time, we have adapted uh, art with Mrs. Wood, uh, Mrs. Hey, Mrs. Wood. And, and then um, um, Mr. Hurley's doing adaptive music with our foundation students. Um, it's been a wonderful growing opportunity for those students. Uh, in addition to that, we are having our foundation students spending more time in, in gen ed classrooms uh, where they're being exposed to more curriculum and great teaching. So we're really thankful for their teachers uh, who are with us. Mrs. Lee is here tonight, um, who, who's been a, a great, I think she was. There she is, okay, yep, head down, there you see it. And she's been, with, her, and with that, and the classroom teachers, and the collaborations have been absolutely wonderful. They've done a lot of great work, and I just think they all deserve their dues for all the hard actual work they've done. So thank you, staff, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That does conclude our board presentation, and we again thank the uh, Board of Education for their continued support. Excellent job, thank you, Mr. Wink. Our next presentation. Sorry, just one second. Sure, one. absolutely. Sorry, just, not really questions. A couple comments though. One, thanks. Great uh, presentation. Um, I just wanted to recognize for all the HME staff, everyone involved. It, it's simple. Or it it sometimes goes um, kind of slips through um, being noticed that we as the board make decisions like, for instance, closing down CSI which affects students and staff and everything else. Something like investing uh, grant money in Chromebooks, which then have to be implemented and actually used in the classroom. And so to make a way too long of a sentence a little bit shorter, 
Uh, just really great work, and thanks for putting up with the stuff that we do that impacts your day to day. Uh, I think everyone on the board is, is aware of it, but we want you to know that we see it. We know that it has impacts. Um, and to hear things like just one little thing in the presentation, Mrs. Bell gave up her planning time. The reality is we know you didn't just give it up. You did that planning later, uh, probably at your house on your own time. And so for all of you that do that, we really appreciate it. Um, and it's, it is great. The Olympics that we came to, um, Mr. Loy was here, and I apologize, I, I can't remember who else. But um, it was an incredible event, and it was great to go around. And I asked the, a couple of the students about the Chromebooks, um, and it's exactly the, the answer like you would love to script because the Chromebooks are never meant to be any sort of replacement. It's an additional tool in the tool belt. But the student's response was, I, I think the question was, how do you like the Chromebooks? Like, are you, you know, learning more? And uh, the little kid, I don't remember his name, but he said, I don't think I'm learning more, but I'm having more fun learning what I'm learning. And that, that's really the goal. <laughs> yes, I agree. So. Uh, when the, the staff just jumped in right with both feet, it's just only going to get exciting when we think what the future is going to bring with the Chromebooks. Um, and in the classrooms, you go in every day and kids are on the floor, they're sitting in the windowsill. Chromebooks are used all the time. And then when you see our kids going to the art room, for example, the teacher's pushing down the Chrome cart because the art teacher's going to use Chromebooks in some form of her art classroom. So they're really starting, to, they, 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 right from the get-go, started to embrace what all the possibilities are. And we really look forward to seeing what that's going to be in the years to come. And really for our kids and the multimedia and all the things they have today, it is a great hook. It's, it's something that they're used to doing, they like seeing, and um, if that's the tool, then it's a great tool and we'll continue to use and excel on it to help all of our students reach their potential. Yeah, and, and just a, a quick piggyback. So I know a lot that goes on in this building because I pop in here from time to time, but also board member Lori Wood volunteers here, and it's just praise for your staff. Loves what the teachers are doing, the students with the Chromebooks, and I was telling a student in the high school today that when I was in high school, my parents had half of an encyclopedia uh, packet, uh, pa like package, and they went halves with the neighbor. And I do remember knocking on the door saying, I had to do volcano, and they would be like, All right, hold on, Tommy. And they'd come up with the V and they'd hand that to me. And I just, I just, I'll never forget that. And just to see the excitement, the immediate information, but really, I love from your library media specialist about helping them choose the right sources to look at is a, is a skill that they're going to need in college and career to be able to do research correctly. So I'm so excited. I love your invitations to the board, and we take advantage of that, and to us the district office to come to all the wonderful things that you have here. Whether it's using technology or it's just a, a different kind of research, we value that. And again, great job. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Moving right along, we have our next uh, special education presentation from Ms. Teresa Ross, Executive Director of Pupil Personal Personnel Services. this technology I have to piggyback before and what a group to follow but you talk about the Chromebooks and the foundation students in this here in the building that are so near and dear to what we do I was here a couple weeks ago when they had the third grade Viking walk and to see a, three of our students one did um, she had labeled a Viking ship one had built the Viking ship and then another one had taken the Chromebook and had a video and it was just him dancing but it was him explaining and doing what he knew of it so kudos to Laura Lee. And back there, too, I have to acknowledge Lynn Amell and Jackie Straub. They are phenomenal here. <laughs> but to see the, the inclusion and see them in the classrooms, that's what it's all about. So uh, this is just meant today as a brief overview, just to give you a little idea about the special ed and the different things that go on and where our students go. As of last week, 
we had total 514 identified students within our walls. Um, we had 486 uh, students that are within our classes that have IEPs and 28 students that attend a BOCES program of some type. That's where the 514 comes from. The 134, those are 504 plans. 504 plans are considered gen ed students, but our psychologists take care of all of that. So really when I look at a number, I include that. And what's not there yet, the state is bringing it around, are 99 preschool students in CPSE, um, where the state is saying, in their infinite wisdom, that our teachers will be asked to go and do evaluations, provide services, where right now it's a county activity. The state is looking to make that, including district um, employees as well. So if you added all of them in, we have 747 students right now that are involved somewhere in the special ed world. So quite a few. Uh, within our buildings, identified students, you can see how many students we have per building. Those are my um, IEP students. They, these are not the 504s. 504s we consider a little bit separate, um, but these are truly identified. And you see the percentage based on their school population, how many students we actually have population-wise within our district. Obviously, the high school is going to be the largest with the four grades, followed by the middle school. Hastings leads the charge uh, for elementary, but right now they have the foundations program that came here a few years ago. So with that, you have to add all of those in on top of. So if you take out approximately 20 students, you're pretty close to the four elementaries being pretty equal, but having those two foundation classes here bump up the number, and next year it could be even more. We're waiting to see how our preschoolers coming in, if we can maintain within two programs. Teresa, can I ask you a quick question? Yep. Do you know for, and you don't have to say which one, but for any of the schools or age levels, is that uh, out of the norm of what you'd see like in surrounding districts? Like, is there anywhere we're an outlier or is this pretty much what we'd expect? I think that's pretty much what you, you can expect. Okay. Though it's Oswego and us are the largest just because we have the largest student population. But if you look, I compare us to Oswego just because it's Oswego County and we're usually within 10 or 12 of them. So I would say that's pretty much the norm. Um, a little bit of what's gone on in our life in special ed, and those three ladies have lived it. Um, last March, we got a nice letter from the state. We were up for a program and services review. When I talked to my predecessor, Sue Forday, she said it had been at least seven, eight years since the district had gone through one of these. We hadn't done anything wrong. It was just our number was up, the state does a program and services review, and they come in with books of things that we have to fill out, submit back, it started in March and we ended the end, end of December. It was quite the experience, but it was very enlightening. It was, it's kudos to all our teachers for the programs and what they do. It was semantics is what we got dinged on, the wording of different things. They came in and that's just a brief idea of what they went through. They looked at all of our programs. They looked at how we offer related services. They looked at how do we write um, our IEP plans, how is the, what's the wording, have we, have we put everything we need in there? Prior written notices, anyone that has a child that has an IEP, you know every time we meet, there's a prior written, written notice that goes out. How are our goals written? How are our FBAs and BIPs written? Were they adequate? Uh, there's something that, uh, and this is what's going to impact the foundations class possibly next year, there's something called the 36-month rule. When you look at anyone below the age of 16, when you put them together, you can only have groups no larger than 36 months. So when you go to look at that foundations class for all the kindergartners that are coming in, you start looking at birthdays and you start seeing, I can put this population together, but now I need to bump up this one because of the 36 months. So it's something we've got to look at. And we're keeping a watchful eye on Laura. She's got a running list of all the students um, that we've got and the ones that we think that are going to be going, going to the program next year. Variances. We have ICT classrooms. You can, you're allowed 50% of the population can be special ed. Well, if you go over that 50%, you have to write a variance. Things happen, students get scheduled in. We wrote a few variances and the state was fantastic about it. 
Uh, they, but what was really cool is that they came in and they followed the students. They gave us a list of students. They came in and they said, we want to see 40 of your IEPs. And when you pull a file, you pull a file for some kids, six, eight, ten inches. They went through all of it. And from there, they decided what students they were going to follow, what CSE meetings they were going to go to. They spoke to parents. They looked at every, I had to supply every teacher's certification, every TA certification in what area. They checked all of those. And what was really cool is they came and met with staff, my staff. So we had all 69 people, which were all special ed teachers and related service providers, uh, school psychs, all of them came together at the high school and they explained their findings. And they gave kudos to the teachers that what they found was verbiage. It wasn't anything about our programs. Our programs were, were top notch. They came to our uh, summer retreat um, in August up at Tailwater to, de to debrief the administration and what, just what they had found. And they were very complimentary of the different programs and what we offer. We made corrections. They checked it off. But in December, like I said, we got a letter that said we were all in compliance and everything was good. But it was a definite, definite learning activity. Um, but one that couldn't have been done without all of our teachers working diligently to meet those dates because it was a difficult time. March, as you know, we start annual reviews and here comes the state. And when they want things, they want things. And then we kind of took, we had a little break over the summer because no one's in session and it started right up in the fall. And that's when you've got students transferring in and out, trying to work with through programs. So it was a busy time, but everybody kept working and we made it through. So it was huge. Um, but kudos for Central Square. Um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about the different programs. There's so much about special ed. You can target it on different areas. So what we thought was just to give you a brief smattering of the different programs we have and that we're, we discussed. It's our continuum of services. There's one for elementary, one for middle school, one for high school. They have the same things. They just might look a little bit different, their descriptions and that. So what we offer, consultant teachers. Some people hear about this. It's called direct consultant or indirect. Direct is when you have a teacher in the classroom that's working specifically with special ed children, not with everybody else, but with special ed children. Indirect is when you have a teacher that's work, a special ed teacher working with a gen ed teacher to, to help them see how to modify different things, how to work with a student, answer any questions. All of that goes on an IEP. Resource room, people, it's not, or what some people think, it's homework help, it's not. It's skill building, it's pre-teach, reteach. it can be in class, it can be out of class. Again, depends on what the needs of the children are. This district is fantastic and I can come to Tom and say, Tom, I've had this student come in, this is what we need, he makes it happen. It's, it's always student first. And, and that I, isn't, it's not like that in other districts and I hear about that from other directors when they'll say, what kind of programs do you have? And I'll share this. I know I shared everything that we offer with a director at Phoenix and she's like, wow, you guys, it's, you really are student centered and that's what we are. Um, so we have resource and all, again, all of these at the different levels. Integrated co-teaching, the elementaries do this the best. They're with their teacher the whole day. They have a uh, special ed teacher that comes in for ELA and math and they're working with everyone. That's the nice part about integrated co-teaching. It's not just a, t a special ed teacher coming in to work with a few students. It's a special ed teacher coming in, working in conjunction with that gen ed teacher to really work with the entire class. One day you walk in and the special ed teacher might have a couple special ed students and a gen ed. The next day you've got a gen ed teacher who's working with a special ed. And they get to work with the high, the low, they work with each other. So the programs, the elementary, it just, it works. It's been here the longest. It was here when I got here. We have ELA, and math ICT at the middle school, and we have a little bit of it at the high school. And as you move up content-wise, sometimes it gets a little bit more difficult. You're focusing in, in on what regions, what do they have to know, um, and those kinds of things. But the elementary, they do a phenomenal job. We have special classes, they're called 15 ones. These are the students that are very low cognitively, um, are more than 50% off grade level. So if I've got a sixth grader, they're reading at a third grade reading level. We still need to expose them to the content, but in a different way. It's prioritized, it's modified. We start that in middle school, and actually next year we're gonna start one again with Tom's okay. 
Uh, a 15 one we're kind of a bridges program in the elementary. It'll be one classroom for all f for fourth and fifth grade students. These are the students that have get gotten everything, every special ed, special ed service there is. They've gotten every gen ed service there is, and it's still not working. It's just they need a smaller group. They need that individualized attention so that hopefully we can backfill some of what's missing and get them on to the middle school. Uh, so that's our 15-1. Uh, behavior management, we have high school, middle school. Uh, those are our kids who are social emotional. Those are the ones that have a long list of referrals, a long list of suspensions. And our goal is always to keep our students in-house. To only have 28 students going to a BOCES program is huge. In past years, we could have been in the 50s somewhere, where teachers are working diligently to keep these students within our walls. They're our students. We want them with us. Um, but we have behavior management at the middle school and the high school. And then our foundations, like we've been talking about, we have the two classrooms here, one at the middle school and one at the high school. And these are BOCES programs. And I have a little goodie for you when we get done. I'm always asked, what, do the, what are the different BOCES programs? What do they mean? Well, what I did, th this is what we've got. This is where we send students. Right now, I can tell you we have three students in our full-day work-study program at Fulton. We have five going to a half-day program, which means half their day is spent at the high school. In the other half, they get to go out to SUNY Oswego and actually take classes in, in uh, uh, learning different job skills. And then they'll place them either on campus or in the Oswego community. We have three students that attend the full-day G. Ray Bodley program, the 1214. These are for our multiply severely disabled students. A lot of these students require medical attention, communication devices, more than what we can manage here. Um, Stepping Stones, that's the most expensive program. Uh, we have two of them, um, and it's held at 4th Street, and Hillside is connected with that. It's the medica medication management, it's the mental health part, it's the family counseling, it's really a team effort. And again, students that when I first came to this job, I think now five and a half years ago, are now, those students are back in our program. They've graduated, they've walked our stages. So it's, it's what they needed at that time. They learn the different st strategies, they work with Hillside, and they come back. Um, the STRIVE program, it used to be called the 611. We, there are three sites. One is the city campus, is the, are the high school kids. Central Square Middle School has a program in Maroon Elementary in Phoenix. Right now, we have three in the elementary. None of ours are, we've had our two that we had have moved um, from the middle school program. And we have three at the high school level on the city campus. And the full day autism is an exciting program. It's been going now, I want to say, for two and a half years um, with city we, we've tried, and Melanie Payne is my, she, she tried everything. And I can think of this little boy we had at Millard Hawk, and Melanie tried everything possible to include, the, have this little boy feel comfortable and want to be in the school. And it was just too much. He was, he was phenomenal. The dad was great. Melanie and her st the TA, the, you name it, they tried it, they researched it. It was just too much. Well, now we have an autism program that we can send students to. The elementary is, had, is held at APW Elementary, and we have four. We have three students in the middle school program at our middle school, and we have actually one full-time and two half at uh, the program on the city campus. But it's something that's new that wasn't av available. So much in the past, if you look at the strive is really behavioral, the stepping stones was the mental health piece, the full day at G. Ray Bodley were for the multiply disabled, and then you had your students that really, that you might be looking at a local diploma, a CDOS, a skills and achievement. They really need the, the workplace hours and the transitional skills. Those are the two work study. We had nothing for autism students. And if you could see this little boy and what he's doing now is just phenomenal. I've seen these little, these children when they came to the district and to see where they are now, it is just, it gives you the chills. Um, but they're phenomenal programs, but we do everything we can to keep them with us first. That, they are our students. When need be, we send them off and then we bring them back. And I know Maureen had this in one of her budget slides. It just shows you uh, the staff and where they're placed throughout 
the building. Our elementary has grown just because we've had students come in and we need to cover our, we need to cover minutes on the IEP to be in compliance. Uh, we just increased one teacher from a .6 to a .8. We had a student come into Burton that needed resource minutes, and the teachers there, they were about as rigid schedule-wise. There was no wiggle room. We were able to bring this teacher who was at call, and she's coming down there to Burton to end her day to provide the resource for this little second grade girl every day. So that's where we get the points from. Um, our speech, we share. I have one that kind of travels all over wherever need be. Um, we, have an, we share between here and call. It's based on numbers. When, and I, we talk about, I know Larry mentioned how teachers are teaching new classes. We look July and August, all right, where do the therapists go? Where do we need them? Where are our numbers? And they know it's coming. They know when they leave in June. We may not know yet, um, but it, it is what it is. They're district employees, and they know they'll work wherever they're needed. But that's uh, who we have uh, working in the special ed world. And that's it. It's any, again, it's just, I will come present whatever you want. It's just, this was like a little overview just to show you what special ed was about. And like I said, I have a handout that just shows you, it explains all those BOCES programs. I have what the purpose is, what the academic levels, the program design, what behaviors, and what the program targets are for those individual programs. Just so you can see where our money is being spent and why. Thank you. You can tell it's one of those topics. <laughs> my, my opinion is it's one of those topics where we probably have plenty of questions, but it's a difficult topic. And it, it, yeah. Well, and that's why I didn't put this on there, because if someone's watching and they know I go to this program or this yeah. type, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. Thank you very much. We're going to make a slight modification to the agenda. Just move the budget presentation. Uh, we'll include it uh, in our superintendent's report uh, when we get to that. Um, and we're going to uh, kind of run through just approving our meeting minutes so that we can be respectful of some uh, guests we have here in their time and uh, have them join in the conversation. So can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes uh, for February 26th? I'll make the motion. Ms. Fishman, second by Ms. Wood. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. All right. And with that, um, we're going to move to unfinished business. Uh, the first topic under unfinished business is district-wide safety and security. Um, and in particular, we're going to be uh, discussing, I would think, in, in some length, the uh, proposal and topic of safety patrol officers. And so, um, uh, Mr. Kolobuf, I'll let you uh, begin this and introduce our guests. Yeah, so I thought people in the audience wouldn't mind if we delayed um, some fantastic presentations on fiscal stress and property tax cap. We just pushed that down a little bit, um, and then we could have a, uh, a discussion again. Two of the people that I wanted to come here to speak today, I just want to give a quick, quick, very quick backstory. So several, several months ago, well before the uh, Parkland um, Florida school shooting, we were looking at safety. We're looking at the idea of school resource officers. If you are here and you're new to the district, we had a school resource officer that was a trooper that was through a grant that um, the state had given money to schools and they were able to do that. But then that money kind of uh, went away and then dis a lot of districts kind of pulled back on that. But that's something that the board was very supportive on well before the school shooting. So when we were, it was actually at a snow day that I had called. We were actually, it was myself, board president, and Ken Sherman, uh, the mayor. We're actually there filling a room with a bunch of school resource officers, and we were having the conversation, and we were talking about, you know, how that we were interested in, in going that route. Um, the person that kind of orchestrated that, in our invite, was Officer McCarthy, who's here. Also, we have Harlan Fox, the chief of uh, Central Square Police, that are here right now. And we just kind of want to give you an idea about this position called um, the special, it's a special patrol officer. Originally, we had safety patrol officer, special patrol officer. And so we'll have um, Officer McCarthy 
give some um, feedback on what that really is all about. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for coming, both of you. Thank you for having us. How about that? Is that better? Perfect. Okay. Thank you for having us here tonight. I'll just give you a little brief background on myself. Um, I was a police officer out in the town of Clay. I'm currently the director of security for the Liverpool Central School District. I also work for the Central Square Police Department, and this year I happen to be president of the State of New York Police Juvenile Officers Association. That's the association that does most of the school resource officer training in New York State. We literally train officers from New York City all the way up to the borders. So I have a pretty good background on school districts and how they run on the SRO program as well. The title of Special Patrol Officer is something uh, we worked with over in the Phoenix School District. Um, a big problem that you have is getting retired officers to come back because there's a cap on how much they can earn by the state of New York. They can earn no more than $30,000 a year. Civil Service created this position where it'll allow somebody to make up to, I believe, $40,000, maybe a little bit more. So it's an attractive thing to get a returning or a retired police officer who has a lot of experience to come back into the schools. All of these officers will have to be trained. It's a one-week training to become a school resource officer in New York State. Uh, I think I got my training in 1999. I was in training class for this, for SRO, when Columbine happened. So it was kind of an interesting thing, but the state has been embracing it more and more. There's a lot of pending legislation that's coming down the road. You're going to start seeing a lot more SROs pop up. So I think it's very proactive that these guys have been working on this for quite some time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, and I think a key thing to point is some people said, well, in their mind, when they think of retired, they think of an older person. That's not the case. So you can have a certain amount of years in, um, for instance, I'm 43. Thank you. And, uh, and I have friends that are also, in my age, who are police officers that are eligible to retire after having a certain amount of years 20 in. 20 years, yep. 20 years. So they're at, at their prime, in great physical shape. I just wanted to say that because I, I did get a lot of emails from people thinking that in their mind of a retired person that was going to be coming in, I just wanted to dispel that. Correct. That's Without saying point. anything of ageism yep. or anything, because those people at that age are awesome too. Right. No, <laughs> that is an excellent point. It's also important to note that they're going to have to maintain certification as a police officer in New York State, which would include annual training in firearms, all the training that officers receive. So he's quite correct. You'll have to have somebody that can meet the current New York State standards to perform the function. And then I just wanted to kind of give them, and Harlan, if that's where you want to pop in, just kind of where we're at right now. We had a workshop with the village and, and asking questions of insurance and those kind of type things. But if you want to just touch upon the partnership that it has to be, because they will become Central Square Police um, Special Patrol Officers, part of your department. Sure. That's, that's correct. Uh, the thing is, whoever we get, it'll be a selection but through the police and through, I assume through the school, correct? Yes, joint. And, right, it's going to be a joint thing. And uh, we've We've got to see, first of all, if it's going to be okay or approved, and uh, then we're, going to, well, we're just going to go from there. But we're definitely ready to look into this as far as getting people into the schools. And uh, I've been a policeman for almost 49 years, and I, I, I want to tell you all, I really think that this is something that we need, not only in our school district, but in all school districts, and uh, we will. I'm going to be retiring soon, but we will. We're, the village is looking at a new chief, and I know that whoever they select will be of uh, oh, a special or outstanding person. Yeah, and the great thing too is there's research out there and talking to some SROs, there's research out there that actually shows for school districts that have school resource officers, the number of burglaries and vandalism has dropped significantly because just having those officers within the schools and connecting with students, they hear things, that's their job, they're trained, and certain students just innately seek out the school resource officer to be able to say some things that are going on in the, in the community. 
the superintendents um, had shared with me from Phoenix, Mexico, Fulton, and Oswego in our county, they all have um, school resource officers. They raved about them for those same situations, whether it's regarding um, drugs, um, and they can do um, kind of professional development for staff, um, and even to talk to some students regarding, you know, some of the things that they struggle with. It's just a great resource, not just in case of that emergency that, God forbid, never happens, but it's all of the other things that they bring to the table. And for $40,000 where the district doesn't pay benefits to is pretty phenomenal to be able to have somebody that, as you said, that has to be recertified and, and top-notch all the way straight through. Is a, it's a no-brainer for, uh, for me. Yeah, I, I would just... It's more of a comment, and it's really for people, uh, uh, community listening, because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, if I were a community member, what might I want to hear or know about this? And it was in being able to go to the, what was it called, the SRO meeting? Yeah, Onondaga County, the district attorney's office, holds a monthly meeting with all the SROs, so we get together, talk about what's going on in our schools, and compare information, because generally, if it's at one district, it's coming to another one soon. Yeah, and that, that was a great meeting. I was glad I got to go, because to me, what it opened my eyes to was... You know, I, I look at the, the role, probably as I guess most people would, as at the point of any sort of incident, something in the school that happens, of taking action. And what became clear in listening to people from all these districts is it's 12 steps before that. It's, you know, knowing what's going on in the school. It's identifying how people are relating. And uh, it, so it's, there's just so many benefits to the position. And, you know, the, the fact that it happens to be a uh, retired police officer is authorized to carry uh, a weapon is, my humble opinion, almost <laughs> irrelevant. The, the massive benefit is all the skills they bring from a lifetime of experience of doing this role. And it, so it was great to see um, the, the community. The other thing I would want you to know is there are so many things we as a board and as an administration have to be careful about. And our we actually have our law firm working on some draft right now for us is there are certain things that we're able to and will discuss in public. There's a lot that will be executive session because it impacts the safety of our staff members, of our students, and our community. Um, and so uh, speaking for the board, uh, we will, in any area we're able to, make it a public discussion um, as long as it doesn't sacrifice safety and security. Outside of that, it'll be uh, executive session. So. Um, with that, do you want to remind everyone again about yeah, next Monday? Yeah, so we're really excited. Um, on the 19th um, of March, we are going to be having the um, School uh, Safety and Security Community Forum. And we are going to, we didn't put an end time on that. Um, I'll stay there as long as people still have questions. But we wanted to be able to do it in a way that we have people at different tables. We didn't want it where some people that are really good at talking, kind of, I don't want to say manipulate the conversation the whole time, but we, if we do it right, we want to be able to get as many concerns out there as possible. And if we do it, if any of you are familiar how we did it when we consolidated and we were at the fire uh, station in Hastings, we did it in a very kind of organized way, and then at the end, just the whole group discussion. So that way, people that normally you know, feel that their voice, they don't feel really comfortable speaking to everybody, but they may at a table of eight or ten. And so that's just another really good way to be able to get them and get their concerns out there. Because we, we originally had it on the 14th, but then there were things that weren't on the, uh, the district calendar. It was elementary parent conferences. We had a uh, teacher quickly remind me, and uh, I changed that. And um, so we, it was really good on the 19th. But as everybody knows... It's very difficult to find any day where you don't have something scheduled across the entire district, but we really feel the 19th is perfect. We also have um, a, a fire chief from Fulton, who uh, Mr. David Eve, he's going to be there as well. As children go to our building, he had some phenomenal ideas. Um, there are things that other districts do um, in communities, community paramedicine. Um, that we're looking into all of these different things, and then especially in a case of emergency, um, in which I can feel comfortable right now because there's nobody kids here, one's a little one we really want to understand. But there's, uh, there's things that happen like during school, school shootings where the people just unfortunately, they, they bleed out. And, and people put signs up in the windows, but it may take two hours. Well, with his background, that there are things that can be done by students that save lives. And the reason why I touch upon this is even if, God forbid, God hopefully, that there's never ever any uh, type of 
tragedy like that, our students go off to all parts of the country or the world, and they could be at an amusement park and something were to happen. They could be boating and somebody's arm comes off. And it's just good that they have those skills. We talk about the attribute of a Central Square graduate, again, problem solving, acting in the moment. We want to make sure that the students, when they graduate from here, this, th those are skill sets that we feel are vital in any community. So those are all things that are going to be discussed. And then how to build capacity with our staff, but also with our students to be able to provide them with those ongoing opportunities. In other countries like Sweden, that's part of the routine. They do those kind of things. In Japan, it's the same situation as well. They just they have that knowledge, and it's expected when they graduate. It's not just the academics, but it's this whole other piece, this community piece. And so we're very interested. And again, that will all be discussed on the 19th, as well as any concerns that come up. I thank the both of you. I've been able to call on you in my time in three years, and before that, I know that the district is often calling you. You're both wealth of knowledge, and, I, and we really appreciate that. Any other questions from the board? Not a question, but a couple of quick comments. Um, Thank you for coming, both of you, Our this pleasure. evening. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. This is this school resource officer, very similar to getting back to the what I'll call 1940s, 1950s beat cop, where they were actually on the street, got to know the people, got yeah, to know community-oriented policing. You're yeah, correct. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, which which is a great thing because then you know where the kids belong and what they should be doing and that type of thing versus. I, as you probably know from being a police officer, covering hundreds of miles and you and don't get to see It's also a that. great thing for the district because that officer may have been in these families' homes and seen the other side of life that the school doesn't get to see. So if they need those services, the officer can also direct the school that way. Gotcha. gotcha. The great thing is that they will not be called away from our buildings. Correct. So if something was happening in a store parking lot, they're going to do an all call. They would stay here in our school grounds. Um, Secondly, I just wanted to mention you were talking about some things. I won't be able to make it the 19th due to work, but I wanted to throw out there to you guys. Um, there's a program called Stop the Bleed, um, and I have certified kids as young as 10 years old in first aid CPR ED, so um, it can be done by these kids. He's going to be talking about that in the 19th, Stop the Bleed. Yeah, I'm okay. going to leave some of my cards for any of the board members that want them. It also has the association website. We do an annual training the last week of August, and that's part of the training that we do. And it's also open to board members, school administrators, teachers. We do extensive training in many disciplines, so that's an avenue if you're looking for some training as well. And we're not a reactionary district. Well before the school shooting, we had an active shooter um, police officer come. He was actually one of the SROs when we were at that meeting. Came and did a whole thing, and our staff loved it. And I love this, these positions because they're not like they talk and then they leave. They'll be here within... Mm -hmm our school building, so that's great. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So on the same related topic all around school safety, at the last meeting, um, we had said and asked administration to do a full review, to, to develop a plan for a full review of all uh, procedures, everything from mental health to on-campus safety to uh, you know, uh, beefed up security, so clearly not expecting the update tonight, but is there anything you'd want to mention or is there any time frame as far as um, we should look for kind of, and again, what can be shared public would be, what can't, wouldn't be, but for a, kind of an update on what actions in addition to what we've talked about already that we would take. Yeah, so we're organizing it where, and we've already been talking with the um, police chief, with the um, fire chief, and with um, a kind of a team of uh, EMTs, and to really kind of go through all of our buildings and just basically kind of what the TAS study did for transportation, look at what we have, share our plans with these professionals, and then say, okay, find the loopholes in these, and where are areas that we can do that. So that is going on. But again, when that is done, obviously that is not something that we would share publicly, but it's something we could share as a board. And the reason why I don't share it publicly is there's no way we would ever Worst case scenario, want to get that information in, in uh, the wrong people's hands. Um, and there's when I get to my superintendent report, I will kind of continue this part regarding March 14, because I'm sure that there are parents or parents that have called me saying, you know, are, are our kids really going to be leaving the buildings? So we have been right on top of that, and I will continue that when we get to that part of my superintendent report. Uh, 
Um, thank you for that. And just, uh, again, I guess one final note for the community, and since peop some people watch this recorded, is that there are, the board members get calls on things a lot of times. There are so many rumors out there about what does or doesn't happen in the school, what we are or are not doing. Um, here's here's the, the thing I'd like everyone to know. The board can't take action at, when it involves almost anything we're talking about um, except in a public meeting. So if you're hearing about changes that have been made or happening and it's not on the last recorded meeting, then it's absolutely nothing more than a, a rumor. The day-to-day -day administration of the district is up to Mr. Colabufo and his staff, and there are certainly a lot of changes that are uh, happening there um, when it, in regards to safety and security. But we won't be discussing those at the meeting or, or publicizing it. But if there's ever any question uh, when it comes to a building or something that's happening, um, again, we promote the chain of command, which is speak to the building level administrator, in most cases a building principal. Um, if you don't get satisfaction or response there, then uh, move up the chain, which is available on the website. I won't go through all of it, but at the end of the day, then Mr. Colabufo obviously is a resource. Uh, board members generally are not uh, the place to go to to initiate the conversation unless you're simply providing feedback because uh, we don't run the district. So. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on that. If, if somebody wants an immediate answer, again, I would go classroom teacher. We don't want to jump that. We have the, then the building principal. But again, if someone feels that something is so high, and this happens uh, weekly, parents want to call me directly, um, I'm more than happy to have the conversation because it's often there's just rumors and misinformation being spread. So if you're watching this, I will look right at the camera and say my work cell phone is 315-314-1432. That's 315-314-1432. I carry it at all times. If I'm into an observation of a principal, I'm clearly not going to answer that, but I will call you back. So I get some people kind of want to just go on Facebook or different forums and they want to maybe voice concerns. And I'm not, I mean, that's social media. I'm not going to try to say not to do that. But if anybody is looking for immediate answers, again, I would call the building principal and, and you always call me. And we will, I will personally, I won't go home until I call all those people back. So it's just, I just wanted to just put that out there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, on unfinished business is the policy committee field trips after third week in May. And Mr. Kobuko, I believe we're all set on that. There's a signed, signed right? Yep. Uh, MOA uh, with the union so that now the board, uh, we can confidently approve any field trips that are submitted to us knowing that if it's past that date, then the principal that has signed the paperwork has already approved the exception to the contract. Sure. All right. So that pearl can come off uh, unfinished business. Uh, next one, transportation for UPK. You don't have to. I just don't know if you want to had any update or want to discuss anything. Tonight. I give an update. So we've been looking at, across the county in the transportation of UPK. Some districts do it. Some districts do not do that. Um, but there was there were questions that went out with this year's UPK applications um, that specifically touch upon this. If there was um, UPK transportation you know, would you take advantage of that? Basically, we're just trying to find out, is that really the need? We're going to have that information back, Aaron. That date was in April. Like right before spring break. And then we will have that information. What we don't want to do is just say, yes, we're going to do that. We're going to pay the money. We're going to do those runs. And then nobody wants to put their kids at that age on the bus. So it's just really important. Part of the fiduciary responsibility that I have to the district is to make sure that we're not being wasteful. Because we're really, and this board is doing a phenomenal job maximizing our resources and putting it to improve program. And so that information in April is really going to help us. So it's going to stay unfinished business right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we can finally, I'm sure Mrs. Phillips is, if you could see her, she's going to do a good dance with her legs there. Be happy that we can take off unfinished the policy on cell phones on school buses. And I'll just recap uh, for the board. You can add anything you want, obviously. But um, it was recommended in the TAS study that we look at that because uh, there were some gaps. Mrs. Phillips has <laughs> talked, I think, to our legal department, to Erie One BOCES, um, and basically verified that through our code of conduct and existing policies that we have everything we need, that we're covered, and that it gives us um, plenty of um, ability to manage cell phone use on the school bus. So there's no gaps and we're good to go. So 
that can come off Perl. All right, and then uh, this one will be removed unless there's reason not to, but we had district contributions to clubs and activities. Um, Mr. Cole Buffon, I think there may have been maybe something from Mr. Granzek as well, but anyway, the information on both clubs and sports, I believe, that uh, we had asked for has been distributed. So are there any questions or anything that would prevent us from taking that off the list? Nope. Excellent. So we will remove that. All right. With that, we'll go to uh, board member reports. I do have one thing, but before we do that, uh, any anyone around the table have anything, topics they'd like to bring up? All right. So my one thing is uh, the board recognition program. The board recognition program, what I'm asking the board to consider, uh, and I've talked to Mr. Colbufo about it, is we do some things. So for instance, uh, generally in June, we do a recognition for retiring teachers. Um, but the board really doesn't have anything else as far as um, a, a standard or a recurring thing to recognize employees of the district, whether they be educators or not. Um, and I just think that that is a great opportunity for us to do something. Um, I have some ideas that I'd love to work with uh, people on, but I think if the board would support it, I think it would be uh, probably two, at the most, three board members if they are interested in talking about that. Mr. Colabufo, obviously, and then I would guess that he may assign or ask one or two uh, people from the district to be involved. I know Mrs. Galvan is in charge of personnel, so that is a good choice. Um, but just to, to give, <laughs> yeah, she's like, yeah. Good job. yeah. Um, no, just some ideas were around. So when it comes to kind of regular occurrences, we have new hires. Uh, and I think there's just some very simple things we can do to be more intentional about recognizing when we have a new uh, employee in the district. Uh, then we have tenure uh, that happens. And we've talked at length, the board has, about uh, the importance and, and how critical that is. Um, then the retiring. Uh, but then also years of uh, service and length of service for uh, teachers. Uh, so I'm not talking any big budget items. I just think there's some good recognition we can do. So is there anyone that uh, has comments or would think that there's some issue with doing that? Or is everyone good with just looking at implementing something? Well, good. I yeah. like it. All right. All right, good. So Mr. Cole Buffo. Um, Next meeting is two weeks away. You see any issue between now and then of kind of finalizing the list? And, and with that, if there are any board members that are interested, if you just want to, you can volunteer tonight, but you can just shoot an email uh, to Pearl. I'll do it. This is what's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, I would love to be uh, involved. You need to put Connie on the list. <laughs> I, did not put, I did not put Connie on the list. I suggested she be a great ad. <laughs> um, and, and But as with everything, so I, I spoke to, um, actually I think Pearl put me in touch with someone this week, there's a little bit behind it, right? That we have to make sure that we aren't creating an administrative nightmare for right. the people that run the district day to day to carry out. So that's the importance of having more than just board members saying, oh, here's what we'd like to do, because um, there's unintended consequences. So. Good. All right. All right. So Pearl, that, um, that doesn't have to stay on unfinished business. It'll just be the people working on that when it's done and ready to be presented back to the board, then we'll do that. But the goal is to, my goal anyway, is to have something in place where we can begin to implement it for the 2018-19 uh, school year. That makes sense. So. All right, with that, we will move into the superintendent's report, which should uh, first be the budget presentation you were gonna do. Sure, absolutely. I don't know if it was you or someone else. But. Nope, that's great. So at this point, if we can have our um, very own Maureen Ladd come on up, and she will be presenting on fiscal stress and the property tax cap. So in that thought process, I just wanted to do a couple of quick, easy ones tonight to keep us moving forward. We've had a preliminary budget discussion and we've had revenue discussions. March 1st is when the property tax cap 
has to be inputted into the comptroller's website. So we do know now that the number, the 2.04, is our tax levy increase. I put this up here because this, I think, is a good illustration of what the formula really looks like. And when, you, when people say, oh, it, there's a tax level, levy limit of 2%, that's just the one little piece of it over on the right-hand side. It's an eight-step calculation to come up with your property tax cap. For us, this is what our tax levy limit looks like. <clears throat> Excuse me. You basically start with the tax levy that you're currently in, add in a tax-based growth factor, which is very interesting, this number the state gives to us, and it's supposed to reflect the, basically the increase in appraisals in the properties in our area. And then you get your subtotal, and then you basically adjust for on top of the line and underneath the line for pilots, um, IDEAs, and basically your capital tax levies. And what that's supposed to provide for us, it's basically the capital tax levies that count, is when we vote every year, we vote on capital expenditures as well. So if you have capital projects that were voted on in the past, or for us, our bus purchases, those things add potentially add tax on top of your general fund budget. So these calculations are supposed to put that back in. Does that make sense? So they're giving us like um, leeway for voter approved increases that happened over the years. And basically what you do is you take your building aid against your debt and there's piece, you add and subtract those on the top and on the bottom. And that's where you come up with your adjusted tax levy limit. So for us, our maximum allowable this year is the 2.04%. And that was what we filed with the comptroller's office. We have two months to go back in there and adjust if we decide we don't want to go that high. If we wanted to go higher, that would be um, a supermajority vote. We would have to get 60% or more of an approval rating. So just making sure I'm looking at it right. So mm -hmm. for instance, Teresa stood up here and said we have uh, this 36 month rule, which to me makes it sound like there's probably going to be need to be some investment in there because we're could be, and I'm guessing there's no money that came along with that requirement. Nope. <laughs> so for argument's sake, uh, roughly 70 plus million dollar budget, what the state allows us to do is increase $75,000. And we've also just talked about all the things we'd like to address with safety and security. And I'm just, just painting the picture of how challenging uh, it is, what seems like a great intent of keeping Taxes down, and uh, it's incredibly challenging. So, seventy-five thousand on a seventy-five million dollar budget. Yeah, actually, okay. it's less than that. When we say one percent, we're talking of the tax levy, not of the whole budget. Right. So, yep, yeah. it's a tough one. I used to put the um, another piece to this, and I didn't put it on because it's as the years go by, it kind of becomes more irrelevant, because I think this is the sixth year of the property tax cap. But um, in the beginning, like say 28 districts went for the override, and not even 50% of them passed. And then the next year, it was like 17 districts went for the override. And it's slowly getting where it's just almost not acceptable. If, if you go out there and say, we're going over our property tax cap, it has a negative connotation. So that's something we would really have to think about if we wanted to try that. Yep. Every year the Comptroller's Office actually comes out with um, a fiscal stress monitoring score for all municipalities and school districts. This year, it was changed up a little bit, but I like to go over it with the board just so you understand what it, what it is. And if for some reason in the future we were to get a score, I would hope that I would have you understanding slightly why that would happen. So basically, the comptroller takes what they saw, 
Items that they think are important that would objectively identify issues that could be considered insolvency problems with municipalities. They can try, they try to um, generate enough expectations that they can tell a county, a city, a village, or a school district if they think that we might be in financial stress. Basically, they, this is, I think, the fifth or sixth year of this, too. Actually, it, it came into being with the property tax cap because they're trying to show as the districts and municipalities are subject to the cap, less revenues, you know, how much stress is that putting on, them, on the various municipalities. They are taking financial and environmental indicators directly off the forms that all of these organizations file. So we haven't had any extra work. It's all been on their side, but it's been very interesting the way the calculations have started and what they have kind of morphed into. So there's two, two scores. You can get a financial score and you get an environmental score. And the financial scores for school districts are your year-end fund balance, your operating deficits or surpluses, your cash positions, and how much you're going to rely on short-term debt for cash flow. The environmental indicators are more on the economic or um, demographic side of things, and they've actually changed a little bit this year. For school districts, they look at the um, percentage of economically disadvantaged students. They look at our class sizes, our teacher turnover rates, changes in our property tax, or our, our assessed values, um, voter approval ratings, and they look at the ELL numbers that a district has. And basically, they take all of those things, they take the sum of the financial indicators and then the, the sum of the environmental indicators, and they set out um, a score for each. And then they have um, levels of what your score is. You could be deemed not having any designation, susceptible to stress, moderate stress, or insignificant stress. And these, when these scores come out, they make it directly to the newspaper. So you always hear about a couple of districts in central New York that are in stress, you know, and that's why I like to make sure that we talk about this. If for any reason some year we were to pop up to be in stress, this year, it's well, actually it's been five years, there they are. You can see our fiscal stress scores and our environmental scores. This year they've had a couple of changes in what they are using for the designations, and we have no score on either fiscal stress side or the environmental side. And I can tell you, just looking at it, on the environmental side, one of the factors up until this year has been declining enrollment. So we've always popped a score there because obviously we've been experiencing pretty good declining enrollment. Why they now think that's not a factor They've had different input as the years go by. And on the fiscal stress score, last year when we ended the year, we were in a good position. I know you remember that. And we added to our reserves. And that's popped us right out of, we've always been too low on our fund balances and our reserves. So this has popped us up into a better category. Here's the first indicator, and these are cool. These are all right on the comptroller's websites. Um, this is the unassigned fund balance as a percentage of the gross, gross expenditures. As you can see, we've popped up now to 4.17. Um, I think it's interesting, too, if you compare us to all schools, we're lower and even lower than schools in central New York or medium upstate schools. So our goal really is to have some more fund balance to get us more in line. Easier said than done. But we have popped up, which has helped a lot. We didn't score anything there. Total fund balance as a percentage of your gross expenditures, same thing. We don't have a ton of fund balance, but we have come up. But as you can see, as you compare us to other, all the schools or the Central New York schools, we're still a lot lower. Operating surplus, we're a lot higher this year than other schools because we had that good year and we were able to put some of that money into the fund balance, so that popped us up. And cash investment against your current liabilities. We're not bad in that category if you look at all the central New York schools. 
we don't carry a lot of liability. We have very small debt load right now. And cash as a percentage of your monthly expenditures, we're in a decent position on that too, for sure. They also have a nice little projection worksheet that you can put your, your numbers in there and look out to future years. And I wanted to put this up here just to show you if you, the eight, you kind of probably can't see it, 18 and 19 school years looking at that. Um, I'm keeping us basically, we know right now that we're looking at another $75 million budget. Let's say we appropriate the same amount of money and we have very similar um, unassigned fund balances. Keeping it all the same, the indicator in here that's going to change for us as we move through these capital projects is we're going to start banning. And we did one in December, which is a bond anticipation note. And we're going to do another one in July. And we'll do another one as the year rolls through. What that is is we need the cash to do the project. But we won't take all the cash at once because basically then we would have that money sitting there for two to three years. And you break the arbitrage rules. So as we band, as we work towards having that debt, it's going to bring up our short-term cash flow number. So if you look on here on the bottom, I'm saying next year we go at $5 million and the year after that $20 million, working out to, to our $40.8 million, we're going to pop up a score, 16.7, 23.3. They're still low enough that we would not have a designation, but it's one of those things that's in there. I just wanted to kind of put it on our radar. And that's why some schools all of a sudden will pop up because something funny will happen. And then two years from that, they're back off the list again. So our indicator that we need to kind of keep our eye on is going to be our short-term debt as we work towards financing our project. These are the fiscal stress scores. As you can see, very few schools even get into the susceptible level, and our score is zero which is great for this year. Any questions on that? Just something I want to kind of put out there. All of that is on the website. I have one. Um, back on your 18-19 projections, mm -hmm. if you had used the old set of equations to do the projections, where would we be in relation to the 8.3 that was last year? I didn't do that. I would have to go get the old, old worksheet from okay, last now year. But I, now you got homework. Yeah, exactly. No, I can definitely do that. We will, we might have a little bit of a score, but it wouldn't be that big because our declining enrollment is tapering. So, but I can. I'm just I can looking remember. at the 8.3 to zero. Right. The no. 8.3 is coming. That's on the fiscal score, right. and that was from our fund balance calculation. Right. So it wouldn't, it's well, not it was, changed. It was, it was, it's because yeah, it our fund zero balance. zero on, bo on both. I'm right. just looking at that. Well, where would we be under the old equation? Well, we on heard, the fiscal we side, heard. on the fiscal side, we'd be the same because it happened because our, our increase in the fund balance. On the environmental side, we would be up there a little bit because of the declining enrollment still continues. Next board meeting, we'll get back into the expenditure side of things with um, some proposals on what we're going to do with the budget. Mm -hmm. Tom will do that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you. I'm going to applaud that too. Uh, as a lead into the superintendent's report, I'll just say I'll direct it to the board, just food for thought. But um, it's ironic to me that the same people that are managing our state budget are giving us a fiscal stress score. So I'm just saying I, I don't put a lot of stake in their calculation because when I look at districts that have gone through like what I consider actual stress, I don't think there's been good precursors. I don't think it tells anything. I don't think they give corrective action until they use it as an excuse to come in and Try to take over the responsibility of a district. So that's just my opinion. I'm just going back to Teresa's um, presentation, but I know that you're all hearing about the push that there, the unfunded mandate that we're taking the special, taking more special ed costs. That was what she was talking about with the, the, um, the 
to push from the town money into the district money. So make sure you keep that on your radar as far as the legislation. It's the preschool being paid for by the district versus the town money. Yeah, and that's something, again, as you alluded to, I will be talking at the next budget presentation about those expenditures. And again, whenever I, I seem to say something, it's just natural. A district is a microcosmic society, and there are rumors that fly. It's, it's, it's our job, and it's the board, inevitably, is the job to oversee me to say, okay, are we maximizing all of our resources to constantly improve the programs for those students that you just saw and students like them that are standing here? So it's very difficult decisions that we have to make, but we have to make sure that we're constantly improving and in doing that, there are going to be some decisions that are going to be unpopular, but we, we always have to say why we're here, and we're here for the students to make sure that we're putting out the best program that we can. Thank you. Okay. Your superintendent. All right, superintendent report. Um, I want to give a big shout out to a very, very special night, and that was the Wall of Distinction. Um, Linda House and Maria Bullock do a fantastic job putting this on. Um, Dean Burdick, Mary Ellen Camiso, who works at the district office, and um, Ken Sherman, um, mayor, were the three inductees this time. It's very heartfelt. If you never had an opportunity to go to one of these, I would suggest that um, <clears throat> they're giving their speeches and they're tearing up because that's how much it means to them. Again, it's somebody that was either an alumni or that has worked for the district for 20 years. Maria's, right, 20 years? It, or more. It is very, very powerful. I loved seeing the family members and the way that they embraced and, and, and got to share in that moment with their, uh, their respective family member that got put in. That was excellent, and that was just this, just this past week. Congratulations to our students that attended the DECA State Conference. We had some board members that had traveled up there um, to see that joining myself. Um, it's the second year in a row I got to go, and it's just truly amazing. We talk about those attributes of a Central Square graduate, effective communicator, confidence, problem solving, teamwork, and that was exemplified. So we had um, Alexander um, Lotito. I know. I, I forgot him. And I am sitting on a book right now, just so everybody else, thank you. Yes, just give me a little higher. Business, uh, so Alexander Lotito, he was um, business growth plan, first place. Taylor Converse, job interview, third place. Christopher Suchaki, startup business plan, fourth place. Our top ten were Emily Panic and Nicholas Wines, business law and ethics, Franklin Durzinski and Logan Foster, hospitality services, team decision making. Kalel Atkins, quick service uh, restaurant management. Caitlin Lanning and Gabrielle Strong, travel and tourism team, team decision making. Robert Howley and Caitlin Meagle, uh, um, entrepreneurship innovation plan. Sean Smith, principles of marketing. Yesha Patel, ho um, hotel and lodging management. Great job. The, um, we saw um, a couple of our teachers that were up there did a uh, fantastic job. Um, Michelle Nelson does a great job. Um, it, it, it's just great not only to see them there, but to see everybody from across the entire state come together. The board got to ask some questions of the students. The students were great coming around and kind of sharing things. But it is so intense of what these students have to go through. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. I don't know if, if when I was in high school I'd be able to stand and do that um, to the degree that they do. I don't think that I, I could. It's just so impressive. So we're, we're big supporters of any opportunities to give students an opportunity to do that. I see a business teacher in the back. Uh, Ms. Nicole Heath is here. Um, and again, if you ever have an opportunity, you have any questions, um, you can ask her. And we thank you. <laughs> She's doing a great job with a little girl back there. The VEX Robotics team, this is something that I find just, uh, again, very fascinating. They competed at the New York State Championships this past weekend and won the State Championship Excellence Award and also a second place in the Championship ro uh, Robot Skills Competition. This qualifies the team for the VEX World Championships, Worlds in um, Louisville, taking place over spring break. And again, I want to just touch upon that. 
These are students over spring break that are dedicating themselves to do this. Um, the Excellence Award is given to a single team, and it's the highest award given at the competition. They um, thanked Mrs. Vant, which I saw her today, and I thanked her as well. And she didn't want to take any of the praise. She said it's all the students' hard work. She's a huge supporter and who has been working with them. The team received a banner as state champions, and they would love to come to a board meeting and to thank the board. We are planning that for our next board meeting for your support, continued support. Joe Weaver and Trevor Walker both won medals at the New York State Indoor Track and Field Championship at Ocean Breeze Track and Field Complex on Stanton Island. Both students also broke the Section 3 record in their respective events. Congratulations to both. Congratulations to the members of the Central Square High School winner drumline for their much improved performance and competition this past weekend. This coming weekend will be the annual home winter drumline show at Paul V. Moore. I will be there. They got to actually uh, present as part of the Winter Guard home show this uh, past weekend, and it was fantastic. Great news from the Winter Guard home show this past weekend. The uh, Varsity Winter Guard placed first um, over two schools. The Junior Varsity Guard, uh, in spite of being moved up a class, placed first in their class over four other guards. I didn't even, I had to talk to a couple of parents that are heavily involved in, in supporting and volunteering, and they were, what we're watching, they explained to me, I never knew that you could actually bump some, bump a group up because they're that good, and they were just dominating at what they do. So I thought that's fantastic. I also learned that you don't lose points when you drop the baton. It's how you recover after. And I just thought, wow, that's a life. Batons, Sorry, what is it called? <laughs> What is that? I don't. The, the saber and the rifle. This is why we I didn't stand ask correct. questions on finance. I'm a lifelong learner, and that was awesome. And it's not a flag; it's a banner. Thank you. Um, so that was that was fantastic. And again, I want to take a note: the parent volunteers are. It's just truly remarkable to see. And again, we have that in sports, and we have volunteers, and we have boosters. What you see with, uh, with the guard and what goes into that is extremely impressive. There were several board members that were there in their role as parents that were also uh, volunteering throughout the day. Um, I didn't get there until 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock, but the parent volunteers and several board members were there way earlier than that in the morning to help set up. Good news. For, they do have a credit card now that you can use when you come in. I thought that's... That's fascinating. Yes. Uh, good news from Paul V. Moore. According to a letter we received from SUNY Oswego, we are on pace to set a new record for freshman applications. We had our winners for the Citizenship Incentive Award for February from the Chamber of Commerce. Our winners were from Paul V. Moore, M M Megan Dean, and Nicholas Stevens from Central Square Middle School, Angelie. Haber, Haberer and Carter Stark. I got to go meet with both of them. The middle school, we got there at about 7.20. Right when they got off the bus, we came down. I awarded them with their, with their uh, recognition um, certificate as well as gift certificates. So just real quick, this is something that the, the Brewerton Chamber of Commerce wanted to do, and they didn't want it to be about grades. They wanted it to be about character. So we draw names from the middle school and the high school, and as long as you've never had this year a behavioral referral, you can qualify for this. And um, it was pretty. It was pretty great to see. It was like you know, like forty dollar gift gift cards, embroidered jackets, and the students were extremely appreciative. The, their, those pictures will be on our website soon enough. Um, we are working on the awards for the month of March. A former student, Shyler Locks. Skylar Lox, but I've never seen it spelled like Skylar Laus is doing a very uh, is doing very well at college in Brockport. She made uh, 60 three pointers over 24 basketball games while shooting um, a nearly 45 percent clip from beyond the arc. She averaged 11 points per game, including four games in which she scored 20 or more points. She also grabbed 73 rebounds, dished out 31 assists and finished the season a perfect 34 for 34 from the free throw line. So again, that is one of our students that went on and is doing phenomenal things. 
Um, community Forum on Safety and Security, we talked about that. That's March 19 at 6 p.m. in the Paul V. Moore Cafeteria, and it will just be de devoted and dedicated to school safety. You'll have an opportunity to share your ideas at each table, and then we're going to share all of those ideas out. Um, I just want to touch upon this. So March 14, I've been getting emails. We are going to, I wanted it to go home today, but I was still waiting from one more thing from the um, middle school principal to make sure that before I send something out to all the parents, we want to have a, um, a letter for staff. So really, this is what it is, real quick. If you haven't heard yet, it's been nationally advertised that March 14th, they come right out and say at 10 o'clock for 17 minutes, they were talking about walking out. Well, I'm so delighted when about three weeks ago I started talking with Board Representative um, Reagan Parada, who's also a key member of Task Force, student government at the high school. And then through Reagan, we were talking with uh, Miss Erin O'Mara, who oversees Task Force at the middle school, and it's just a great joint effort with her mother, um, Miss Deborah O'Mara, who oversees it at the high school. So we really wanted to look at this, and I was so delighted because before I could really even say anything, it was the students that said, we don't feel it's safe that we have students walk, walk out because the safety is in the building, especially on something that's been so nationally televised when they're telling everybody where kids would be going out of the building. So I was so happy to hear that. Um, and again, we didn't want to diminish any student voice. So what the, the staff will get, and we're going to include elementary in that as well, because we want the elementary staff to know what we're going to be doing at the middle school and high school. And, and the staff is going to get a very detailed um, series of activities that are going to be going on throughout the day as an alternative in lieu of what the students and we recognize as a danger of sending them outside, especially in something that's been so advertised. So we're really, really excited about that. That parent letter is going to also go out tomorrow we're going to blast that out, and that's just going to, it's not going to be as detailed as the staff regarding the specific activities, but just an overall what's going to be, what we are going to be doing for Wednesday. So if that goes out tomorrow, then they know, um, the parents know, that we're, we're, not, um, we're not endorsing um, students leaving the building just for safety reasons. Um, we have a number of these great activities that are planned. Um, and again, student-driven, that's the voice. When she sat down and shared some of the activities, and then there was um, a specific middle school student that played a key role. I'd love to say his name, Matt Stevens. Um, one of our leaders at the middle school just had some amazing ideas. And really it's about the students getting an opportunity to talk to students within their school that they might never have done before. And they had really kind of targeted that as an opportunity to kind of pay homage to what happened with the 17 uh, unfortunate people, the tragedy in Parkland, Florida. So we're taking pretty much word for word of what the students want to do. Um, I had media reach out to me and they wanted to come in and I said um, respectfully no, that this is something within our buildings that we feel very strongly it was student driven and we just don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that we're trying to capitalize on something with the media. The stu it's, it's something very special they have planned. Parents will get a letter just kind of overlaying what we are going to be doing because I have been getting, you know, what are you going to do? This is what we're hearing about the 14th. So I was just waiting because it's just a little tiny bit different, the middle school compared to the high school. And so I was waiting on that staff letter. I didn't want to send something out to parents until I sent something out to the whole staff first. And that concludes my superintendent report. That is a great point. So on Friday, we had the Leadership Student Conference. is the second one that I got to see. It is, again, student-driven. What I would like to do, and I, I don't feel uncomfortable putting her on the spot to talk about it since she played such a key role in the student leadership, I got to actually run a session with Reagan. Um, if you just want to just real quick just give an uh, explanation about the student leadership and all the districts, that why they come to it. Yeah, so thanks for putting me on the spot. That's what it's but, about. Um, so yeah, we had our leadership conference on Friday, and basically the task force puts it together. So it's a group of kids at the high school and a group of kids at the middle school. And we had about 140 kids come from, dif from different districts in the area. And we just run basically a full day of teaching students leadership skills, leadership qualities, 
we have a motivational speaker come in this time. His name was Andy Thibodeau, and he talked about, you know, caring and land, uh, I can't even say the right word, but it was all about caring and giving the helping hand when needed. And then we go into workshops, and Mr. Calabufo and I got to run a workshop together, so teaching them more about those different leadership skills and different leadership qualities. And then we ended with a roundtable kind of discussion where we go through different activities that different schools uh, do. So we kind of have the opportunity to learn things that other districts do and then hopefully take some of those ideas back to our school. And I got a lot of great feedback from people from Sandy Creek and APW just saying, wow, it, it is really impressive with the character and the leadership that, that you're fostering. And again, I give a shout out to Deb O'Mara and to Aaron O'Mara. They just do a phenomenal job in giving the students and cultivating that voice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colbufo. All right, with that, we'll move into our uh, action items. Can I get a motion to accept item F1, which is, it's a long list, but sorry, uh, I'll read them off the Proposed first reading of district policy is on use of service animals, use of surveillance cameras in the school district and on school buses, professional service providers, education of homeless children and youth, diploma and or credential options for students with disabilities, children with disabilities, preschool special education program, least restrictive environment, preferral intervention strategies, declassification of students with disabilities, students individualized education programs, development and provision, transition services, extended school year services and or programs, and parent involvement for children and disabilities. Who would like to make that motion? I will make that motion. Mrs. Wood, can I get a second? Second. Ms. Fishman, any discussion? All those in favor of the first reading? It's approved, so our next meeting, they will be on for a second uh, reading and then will become policy uh, if approved. Uh, can I get a motion to accept the revised school district instructional calendar? This is Nickerson, second? I'll second it. By Mr. Patch. Uh, discussion would simply be the one uh, change is only March 18th, correct? That is correct. Moving it from 186 to 185 Yep, days. yep, yep. I thought we were going to get a 186-day uh, calendar. Um, we had to take a day, and we looked, and just we thought instructionally to break up March a little bit, which would then, that would be next year, the day after St. Patty's Day Parade. You're yes. welcome. <laughs> really? Yeah, <I> <laughs> Any other questions? Parades are healthy. All those in favor of accepting the Irish version of our instructional calendar? <laughs> it's approved. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement with the CSTA regarding field trips? Mrs. Nickerson, second. second. Mr. Loyer, any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, I'll make the motion for approval of an overnight student trip for A.A. Cole. Second. Second by Mr. Loy. Any discussion? All those in favor? Sorry, Mr. Patrick, I didn't catch you there. Yes? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and can I get a motion for our consent agenda, which would be the entirety of item G? Is that Mrs. Nickerson? Second by Mr. Bedworth and... Give me just a second to scroll down here. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, all those, oh, sorry, all those in favor? <laughs> it is unanimous, thank you. And, sorry, it's folded under. Can, uh, can I get a motion for item H, personnel, instructional, non-instructional? Um, Mrs. Wood and uh, second. Ms. Nickerson, any discussion? All those in favor? All right, thank you. And, sorry, it's hard to see. Um, that's part of H, the top of the last page there, Pearl? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I would like to make a motion that the Central Square School District Board of Education hereby move into executive session 
to discuss negotiations conducted pursuant to the Taylor Law involving all of our unions except the CSTA. Second. Hold on. Okay, so that's that's. And, and except, actually, just say all non-instructional. All non-instructional unions. Uh, also, to discuss uh, matters leading to the discipline, suspension, dismissal, removal, or removal of a particular person. In addition, the potential acquisition, sale, or lease of property because public discussion would substantially affect the value of the property at issue. And finally, matters which, uh, sorry, no, I can strike the last one. Uh, so can I get a second for that executive second. session motion? Mr. Loy, any discussion? And there will not be action to follow on this. All those in favor? All right, we'll be moving to executive session and there will not be action to follow. Thank you. Thank you all.